my name is Russell Berman. I'm on the faculty at Stanford. And uh, I'm, uh, um, I've been asked to uh, introduce Peter. It's a privilege to introduce Peter Thiel. A privilege, but also a considerable challenge to introduce someone as well known as Peter, a leading entrepreneur with a high public and political profile. He's surely familiar to very many of you. PayPal, Palantir, Facebook, Founders Fund. Suffice it to say that Peter Thiel is one of the leaders of the private sector in the United States today. In another era, one might have said a captain of industry. I wish the academic world would have more, more dialogue with the private sector. Born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1967, he moved with his family to Ohio, then to South Africa, and then Southwest Africa, and then to California. He graduated valedictorian near here from San Mateo High School in 1985 and proceeded to Stanford where he majored in philosophy. That was the era of the controversy over the Western culture curriculum in response to which Peter co-founded the conservative student newspaper, the Stanford, Stanford Review, which still thrives. And you heard from the current editor, Mimi St. John. Mimi St. John, I'm proud to say, an advisee of mine, has I'd be remiss also in omitting another aspect of Peter's Stanford trajectory, his encounters with the late René Girard, then a member of the departments of French and comparative literature, and Girard's accounts of religion, competition, and scapegoating, in my sense, uh, my, uh, my point of view, a big piece of what goes on in cancel culture events has to do with that logic of scapegoating. Add to Stanford's, pro, uh, to Peter's profile, his attending School of Law, where he received his degree in 1992 before launching his storied career in technology, entrepreneurship, politics, and the public sphere. Let me end with a quotation that would frame Peter's work from a student. I've been fortunate to be able to teach several seminars with Peter where we've had to limit enrollment and ask for students to apply for admission. Here's what one student wrote. I can't wait for the opportunity to interact with and learn from Peter Thiel. I admire Mr. Thiel for helping found the modern financial payment system with PayPal and for supporting and inspiring hundreds of entrepreneurs through the Founders Fund and the Thiel Scholarship. As someone interested in deep tech, Palantir has always fascinated me for its use of AI techniques on massive amounts of data. I admire Mr. Thiel's integrity to stand by his ideas and believe that this course will add unparalleled breadth to my Stanford education. That's the student said, and I'm sure that Peter will not disappoint us in his comments today. Peter Thiel. Russell, thank, thank you so much. It's always hard to, uh, hard to live up to such a flattering introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to cover a lot of different, somewhat disjointed ideas today, and then try to make it interactive and make it as much of a conversation as possible. But maybe. Maybe uh, you know, a question I always like to start and frame is, what is the antonym of diversity? And uh, the placeholder answer I would give the, the, for an antonym for diversity, the antonym of diversity, is university. <laughs> and, um, and we should, um, and you know, and in some ways what I, what I gather we're, we're trying to come to terms with are all these ways that the university as a place where we search for truth, where there's a certain amount of freedom, civility, uh, you know, a certain canon is, uh, is, is being threatened by this sort of amorphous thing that's somehow uh, the anti-university, that is, uh, um, you know, the postmodern multiversity that is maybe, you know, it's somehow in some parts nihilistic, in some parts relativistic, in some parts totalitarian, and it probably would take, you know, a more time than I have to unpack all of those paradoxes. But I will, and then, of course, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the problem of the university in the larger context of the questions of classical liberalism, and which you know, seems to have be failing and, and in, in trouble in a lot of different ways and, and that uh, one, can, one should also think about. You know, I've, I've been involved in these, uh, in these campus wars, culture wars debates for something like 35 years. We, we started the Stanford, and I'll just recount one, one, one story from 35 or so years ago, uh, around the time we started the Stanford Review in 1987, uh, the, the live issue was the uh, debate about uh, Western culture, the freshman core curriculum program, uh, and it was going to be sort of phased out. Uh, the 88-89 school year was the first year where 
um, the first of the new experimental culture ideas and values. It was the first uh, the pro program to replace Western culture. It's framed as multicultural. And uh, I thought we should do an expose on, on this sort of the first class. Um, and, uh, and it was sort of, you know, t a tendentious Marxist professor. It was not really about non-Western cultures. It was all sort of these various anti-Western writers of one sort or another. And so I went to the Stanford bookstore and just started reading through the books. To tr and of course, you know, I was sort of man with a hammer, tries to find a nail everywhere, and was just trying to find the, the most tendentious things that were, you know, um, and they, they all were on, on different dimensions. But then I finally stumbled on one book that was just the perfect book that encapsulated everything that was preposterous about it. It was uh, I Rigoberta Menchu. Um, and it was a set of interviews with uh, uh, this sort of uh, Guatemalan peasant Indian woman who had been oppressed in every vector of oppression. It was like a, it was like a perfect pastiche. It was, uh, you know, she was oppressed as poor, and as, as, um, there was a racial war, and there was a war, and she was an orphan, and... Um, and on and on down the line, and and it was and you know and then you have these sort of chapters you know Rigoberta renounces marriage and motherhood, Rigoberta makes plans for the May Day parade, so it had sort of a somewhat you know communist undercurrent, um, and um, and as so many of these uh, debates, they, they, you know the, the Western culture debate was somehow very important. It was on one level about a, about this freshman course at this at one you know elite university Stanford, but then you know it was in some sense it was a, a debate about our whole culture, and so the, it sort of kicked up. All these bigger things, and you know, as a sort of 20-year-old senior, I managed to convince the editors of the Wall Street Journal to to reprint uh, some some of these excerpts, and um, did, a, did a long, long, long excerpt on this Europe and the Ameris, Americas class. Um, when when Dinesh D'Souza wrote his book on illiberal education in 1991, the uh, the Stanford chapter was entitled "Travels with Rigoberta," so you know, this was sort of got this iconic uh, um, framing. And then uh, and then fast forward to the uh, Fall of 1992, I'm, I'm clerking for a judge in Atlanta, I'm driving to the office in the morning, have the radio on, and uh, and it's uh, well, you know, there's uh, there's uh, um, a new uh, someone's been selected for the Nobel Peace Prize. No one's ever heard of this woman. It's Rigoberta Menchu, and <coughs> there's always this legal concept of the difference between proximate causation, which is like I punch you or something, versus but for causation. I was not the proximate cause of her getting the Nobel Peace Prize, but I, I, I was a but-for cause. But for me, she would uh, not have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize. And sort of the scales fell off my eyes at that point. I realized I was, you know, I thought that I was, you know, fighting in some sort of cosmic struggle in, you know, the forces of good and evil. And actually, I, I was just like, what I really had been doing was I was some two-bit actor in a left-wing psychodrama where I completed her victimization. The one group she had not been victimized by were, you know, white Republican conservatives in the United States. I completed her victimization and uh, guaranteed her her Nobel Peace Prize. There's a whole postmortem to the story where it's um, uh, apparently much of the book was too good to be true. It was sort of semi-fictionalized. Uh, there was an attempt to get the Nobel Prize rescinded, but uh, you know they can never sort of uh, revisit these things, and uh, and so it's still uh, it's still quite disputed. But you know I think so many of these debates have this kind of quality. There's there's a way that um, you know. Uh, you can sort of, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. The arguments are, uh, are super powerful on our side. Um, it is like screaming into a hurricane. It, it often does not matter. You know, we have, uh, we have um, and there sort of is always this worry that uh, we are somehow, you know, uh, those of us who are conservative, libertarian, classical liberals are just somehow fighting the long defeat. And, uh, and, uh, and that that is... That's that's sort of the vibe of what's going on, and and the, and the challenge uh, with, you know, classical liberalism broadly. And so I want to, so it's, rather than sort of go through a whole set of these sort of semi-pornographic stories, which I could entertain you with, um, the whole morning long, I, I wanted to try a somewhat different approach. And um, and I, I I think it's always important not to sort of straw man our opponents, not to take the most ridiculous. Um, version of it and make fun of it. We should always try to steel man people to try to understand the arguments as as uh, best as they are possible. I wanted to. Do, I wanted. To, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but what I want, want to do is I want to give you the best argument against the best argument against the best argument against the best argument against classical liberalism against um, the the classical universities and uh, so four four steel manned arguments and. Uh, the, um, if you counted it, there are four. So if you do, you know, a double negative is a positive, 
a quadruple negative is still positive, so uh, the, the four best arguments add up to a sort of argument for classical liberalism. But uh, we're going to, let me, let me and, and this is sort of um, the way I've come to think of, um, you know, what, what the real nerve of, of so many of these debates is and how we should, how we should think about it. Um, the, you know, let me, let me start by framing, if you, if you, um, if you talked in the, during the Western culture debates in the 1980s at Stanford, if you talked to the university president, Donald Kennedy, or, you know, the senior leadership at Stanford, if, you know, alumni went to complain, um, you know, there were, I mean, there was definitely, there were always some radical, crazy people who, who said crazy things, but uh, the, the standard answer was something that was sort of technocratic. You know, Shakespeare doesn't matter, the humanities aren't that important, uh, we have the sciences, we're making enormous progress in the sciences, we're building a, you know, particle accelerator, Slack, et cetera, et cetera. We have, uh, you, have, you know, you have all this sort of cutting edge scientific research and uh, that, that sort of fundamentally is what the university is about. That's what shows it's on track. That shows what, what it is valuable. And, uh, and there is sort of some way that we have to always ask this question about, you know, the, the sciences and uh, the technologies, how they are, how they are doing. And the, the version of the question that I have come to ask over the last 15 years um, about, you know, um, is the, the universal question is about the progress of all these things. How fast are science and technology as a whole progressing? Is the sort of propaganda, the STEM propaganda, accurate? That uh, we have just sort of exponentiating progress, runaway progress, things are getting sort of, um, you know, it's just dizzying how fast things are improving. Or is it, uh, is it perhaps quite the opposite? And, uh, and so, um, and, and so if, if, if one could show that the science and technology areas are actually pretty weak, that the so-called crown jewels of STEM are not actually delivering the goods, this strikes me as a decisive crushing uh, blow. It's, it's, it's like, a, yeah, um, humanities, we all know, are ridiculous. Uh, STEM, but if, if STEM is ridiculous, you know, there is just nothing, nothing left at all. And, uh, and this is the idea that I've explored in sort of a variety of formats over the last uh, 15, 15 years. Uh, there's, there's sort of a, um, it's, it's very, let me say, it is very hard to evaluate this stuff in general because uh, one of the other problems of the postmodern university is that it's extremely compartmentalized, it's extremely specialized, and you're supposed to only be able to comment on these things after half a lifetime of study. And so we have ever narrower sets of guardians guarding themselves, to use the sort of corrupt platonic metaphor. So you, you have the string theory people telling us how wonderful string theory people are and how everybody else just has bad math genes and can't talk about it. We have the, uh, the cancer researchers promising us that they will cure cancer in five years, which they've been doing for the last 50. We have um, in an on and on in all these sort of hyper, hyper specialized areas. And, um, and then the question is, <clears throat> you know, how much, how much progress is actually happening? The, um, the sort of indirect intuitions I have on where it seems very, very slowed are things like, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at things like um, the, the economy, the, the standards of living among younger people, the younger generation doesn't seem to be doing better than their parents. This, this is sort of very odd in a sort of context of, of, of massive generalized progress. There is, uh, there's sort of a question, how big are the breakthroughs that are really, really happening? There's the definition of technology. We say technology is the thing that is changing. And, and in, let's say, the 1960s, technology meant computers, but also rockets and supersonic aviation and the green revolution in agriculture and underwater cities and new medicines. It, it was like a lot of things. And when we use technology today, it just means information technology. And I think that's kind of a tell that uh, we have a narrow cone of progress around the world of bits, you know, computers, internet, mobile internet. It's generated some great companies, um, but it's not quite been enough to take our civilization to the next level. We had a tagline on my, uh, my venture capital site, you know, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. Not an anti-Twitter <laughs> argument, not an argument against Twitter as a company. It can, it can work as a company, it can work, you know, 8,000 people, I think it's gonna be about half after Elon's done today. But uh, even, even those 4,000 people can just still just go to the office and smoke pot all day and earn decent paychecks. So it works on that level. It doesn't quite work on the level of taking our civilization to the next level. 
uh, when I was, I think that these things were not that obvious in, 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 in the past. When I was at Stanford in 89, in, in retrospect, the only subject matter you were supposed to study was computer science. That's what really worked. It wasn't even an engineering field. It was sort of a, you know, I always think whenever people say science, I'm in favor of science, but not science in quotes. And when, when people use science, it's, it's a tell that something isn't a science, like political science or climate science. So computer science is sort of like that. It's for the people who are not very good at electrical engineering, and they sort of flunked out into computer science, even though that turned out to be the one thing that worked. All the engineering fields did not work. I think electrical engineering sort of worked for maybe another decade after I was class of 89. Um, certainly mechanical engineering, chemical engineering like my dad did. All of these were terrible things. We lived in a world where there was nothing you could do in the world of atoms. By the 80s, it was already clear you should not go into nuclear engineering, aero engineering, um, and we are just not allowed to do stuff in, in the world of atoms. It's, it, is, it is massively, massively slowed. And I think this is sort of the, this is sort of the, uh, this is sort of one kind of a, a framing I would give, that uh, we've had this um, incredible stagnation for the last 50 years, and then we have unbelievable amounts of propaganda that this is not true. And that, um, I'll, I'll do one, one other sort of thought experiment on you know, why the question of technological progress, however, however hard it might be, um, can't be avoided. Because, um, and let's, I'll, I'll do one more as a thought experiment. If you, um, <clears throat> if you want to sort of solve our macroeconomic problems in the United States, you could solve every problem in our society if you got to 4% GDP growth. You'd grow, grow your way out of the deficits, um, you'd have enough growth for everybody to do better, and how do you get to 4% GDP growth? Well, um, you, could do, um, you could do something like, um, um, one, one version would be, uh, you could change, get rid of all the environmental rules, all the immigration rules, you could, you could get rid of all these rules where you would never get elected. And you probably have too much cancerous growth, but you know there's certain ways you could do it politically completely infeasible. And uh, the other way, I'll sort of do this as a, as a thought experiment, would be um, you appoint a commission on accelerating technological change, and um, it would um, it would try to measure how fast the technological change has been happening. Um, and um, you know you'd have some um, you know some crazy techno utopian person, probably from Silicon Valley. Uh, you, you put them on the commission. And uh, they would come back with the result that, yeah, it looked like we had 2% growth and 2% inflation, but really we have 4% growth and 0% inflation because the qualitative technological improvements are greater than they look. And uh, if you could just lie about technological progress, you could save trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, I, I don't go into all the details. This is basically what happened under the Clinton administration in the 1990s with the Bostrom Commission. Uh, they, they sort of lied about all these hedonic adjustments, and that was a key thing to balancing the budget. As a libertarian, I, I'm actually quite sympathetic to this because I want the welfare state to be dialed back, and so if you exaggerate technological progress, um, this is the way to do it. As an intellectual, I, I, don't like, uh, I don't like lying, and I think we should try to figure out, uh, we should try to figure out the, the, the truth of these things. And, uh, and probably, you know, if, if we say that uh, you know, the flatness of the new iPhone um, is such a large hedonic adjustment that grandma should be happy to eat cat food, there's probably something about that that's wrong. And, I'm, and, and these sorts of questions cannot be avoided. So the, the, the question of generalized technological progress cannot be avoided. We'll go into a lot more detail, but, uh, but it has, for, for a whole set of reasons, slowed down. So that's sort of uh, the, um, the basic counter argument is don't look at the humanities, look at the sciences. They're great. The counter counter argument, um, they are, they are, they are maybe as defective or more so than the humanities. Humanities, we can sort of evaluate. You can evaluate Rigoberto Menchu. You can't evaluate string theory. And so it's sort of, I don't know, the government analogies, it's like, uh, you know, do you think the, uh, the DMV or the CIA are better run? And it's obviously the DMV is better run since people can see what they're doing. Um, and, uh, and that's probably the political intuition we should have about the sciences versus, uh, versus the humanities. The, 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 the polemical version of it that I, I, I had once was that, uh, you know, I, I, think, um, I think that uh, it's better for undergraduates to, mer ma ma um, to major in the humanities rather than the sciences. Let's set computer science aside as the one thing that sort of works, but everything else, because um, in the humanities, you at least know you're not going to get a job, you'll be unemployable, um, whereas in the sciences, you have uh, people who are so deluded as to believe they will be taken care of by the natural goodness of the universe, and it's just, 
it is just a Malthusian competition, nature bared red and tooth and cloths, you know, 10 grad students in the chemistry lab fighting each other for Bunsen burners and beakers. And if, you know, one person says one wrong word, they get thrown off the overcrowded bus and it's a relief and, and uh, it's sort of cycle and repeat. Now the question people always ask me is why? You know, why did this uh, stagnation, why did the shift happen in, in the 70s? And I, I normally try to just avoid the question, say I don't like answering why questions, they're, they're overdetermined and, you know, there's sort of a lot of different kinds of things one can, one can point to. Um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, extra government regulation to, um, you know, uh, some, of, some of the low-hanging fruit was picked. It's gotten harder to find new things. That's sort of the Tyler Cowen argument. Um, you know, sort of strange ways the culture has changed. You know, the younger people have anxiety attacks and don't want to do anything anymore and are sort of hiding in, the ba in their basements, which is probably maybe not, you know, um, not that com compatible with uh, rapid technological progress. But, um, but if, I had a, if I had to sort of give a single, again, steel man idea, the best argument for why, why this has been so slowed for the last 50 years, and that I think we have to somehow engage with and take, take more seriously, is that there is something about science and technology that has taken you know, a very dystopian, very destructive turn in the, um, in the, in the 20th century. And there are, you know, it, it is, um, it is not, we're not in the 18th century, 19th century, you know, rationalist enlightenment age where um, it seems to be simply um, making everything better in every way all the time. Uh, you know, already the two world wars, certainly, uh, certainly the nuclear weapons, you know, on some level suggested that uh, the sort of, um, I don't know, the, the, the sort of, uh, rhetoric of Rousseau or Voltaire about the natural goodness of man was starting to run, you know, a little bit thin by, by, by the 50s and 60s. And, and the, the, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, history I would tell, it's not perfect, but of, of the last 70, 75 years, is this gradually seeped into society. It sort of manifested in different ways, you, you know. Um, you know, you have a crazy person like Charles Manson, you know, what did he see when he was overdosing, you know, on LSD? He saw that there was going to be a thermonuclear war, and then he decided to become some sort of, you know, uh, anti-hero from Dostoevsky and start killing people because everything was permitted in this world that was uh, headed towards the apocalypse. And there was something like this that seeped in. Uh, and this was what gave the environmental movement so much force in the 70s. It's like, we have to just slow this down. We have to put some brakes on. Uh, and it is, it is just the way in which so many of these technologies have this, uh, have this dual use component. I always like to argue rhetorically in favor of more nuclear power plants. Uh, I feel that's like, it's like arguing for the gold standard it's so far outside the Overton window. Uh, and I think the, the history is that it's hard to avoid the dual use nature of these technologies. You know, uh, uh, and the, 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 the turning point with nuclear power was not uh, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. It was 1975 when India got the bomb. We had transferred the nuclear uh, technology to India. We believed that it was not dual usable. It was, it, there was a certain way it could be used for only peaceful nuclear power. It easily got weaponized. They got a nuclear bomb. We can't give nuclear power plants to everybody in the world because everybody will have nuclear bombs and that's sort of uh, profoundly unstable and will, will blow up the world. And something like this, this dual, you know, this dual nature of technology runs through uh, so much of this stuff. There's obviously, you know, um, there's obviously an, an environmental uh, version on the left that, uh, that I, I, I would say is, you know, on some level more powerful than people on the right often like to admit. There is, um, there is um, you know, even, even the kinds of breakthroughs that we, we had in recent years, the mRNA vaccines. And again, the, the sort of the polemical version I have is why can't we have a ticker tape parade for the scientists who invented the mRNA vaccine. And, you know, well, else we don't celebrate individuals, that's too dangerous in the 21st century, so we no longer have ticker tape parades for individuals. But, um, but I think the deeper reason is people are really uncomfortable with the mRNA vaccine because it is, you know, it's very adjacent. Um, it's one toggle switch away from this thing that was going on at the Wuhan lab called gain of function research, which we suspect is sort of an Orwellian word for a bioweapons program. And, uh, and then this is, and so it's again, there are, you know, there are these things that, you know, could potentially be big breakthroughs. So many of them are adjacent to something that is, that is quite dystopian. I, I used to love science fiction. 
it is, um, and I think it would be sort of an in interesting survey course that one could do on, on you know, trying to understand why it is all so drably dystopian at this point. I mean, there's still, you know, maybe you can do the retro Star Trek stuff from the 60s, but anything that's been published in the last 40 years, it just sort of shows this futuristic world where nothing works. And the question you have to ask is this, is this a deep law of nature? Is this a deep truth that if there is more progress, things will just break down? Or is it somehow a reflection of, of, this, uh, of this very dy dystopian culture we're in where we just can't imagine anything, um, anything getting better? <coughs> now, I think, um, I think that, uh, I think that um, this sort of uh, dystopian um, limit of, uh, of science and technology where you know, it, it's lost energy because you're just sort of building the machines that will destroy the world um, has even at this point seeped into the um, has even seeped into the uh, into the um, into the uh, um, computer uh, world, where the you know the futuristic technology on the computer side is AI, AGI, artificial general intelligence. It's a, it's always I always hate the word because it's sort of this catch-all word that can mean everything and therefore nothing. But um, but I you know I was involved peripherally with uh, some of these sort of East Bay rationalist futuristic groups. Uh, there was one called the Singularity Institute in the 2000s, and the, the sort of the self-understanding was, you know, building an AGI, it's going to be this, this most, the most important technology in the history of the world. We better make sure it's friendly to human beings, and uh, we're going to work on making sure that it's friendly. And, you know, the, the vibe sort of got a little bit stranger, and I think it was around 2015 that I sort of realized that, uh, that uh, they weren't really, uh, they, they didn't seem to be working that hard on the AGI anymore, and they seemed to be more pessimistic about where it was going to go, and it was kind of a, it sort of devolved into sort of a Burning Man, um, Burning Man camp. It was sort of um, it had gone from sort of transhumanist to luddite um, in, in 15 years, um, and uh, some, something had sort of gone wrong. Uh, my um, and it was finally confirmed to me by by a post from Miri Machine Intelligence Research Institute, the successor organization, in April of this year. Um, and this is again, these are the people who are. And this is sort of the cutting edge thought leaders. Of the, of the people who were pushing AGI for the last 20 years, and, and you know, it was fairly important in the whole Silicon Valley ecosystem. Title, Miri announces new death with dignity strategy. And then the summary, it's obvious at this point that humanity isn't going to solve the alignment problem, i.e. how is AI aligned with humans, or even try very hard, or even go out with much of a fight. Since survival is unattainable, we should shift the focus of our efforts to helping humanity die with slightly more dignity. <laughs> and uh, and then it, anyway, it goes on to talk about why it's only slightly more dignity because people are so pathetic and they've been so lame at dealing with this. And of course, um, you can you know there's probably a lot you can say that you know this was there was somehow this this was somehow deeply in the logic of the whole AI program for for decades that it was was potentially going to be very dangerous. If you believe in Darwinism or Machiavellianism, um, there are no purely self-interested actors. And then, you know, if you get a superhuman AGI, you will never know that it's aligned. So th th there was something, you know, there was a very deep problem. People have had avoided it for 20 years or so. At some point, one day they wake up, and the best thing we can do is, um, is, is just uh, uh, hand out some Kool-Aid a la People's Temple to everybody, or so something like this. And, um, and if we, um, and then I think, uh, uh, lest we just dismiss this sort of thing as, as, just, uh, as just the kind of thing that happens in a, um, a, uh, a post-COVID mental breakdown world, I, I found another article uh, from Nick Bostrom, who's sort of an Oxford academic, and you know, most of these people are sort of, I don't know, they're, they're somehow, they're interesting because they have nothing to say. They're interesting because they're just mouthpieces. They're, it's like the mouth of Sar Sauron. It's, it's just sort of complete um, um, sort of cogs in the machine, but they are, they're useful because they tell us exactly where the zeitgeist is in some ways. And, and, um, and this was from 2019, pre-COVID, the vulnerable world hypothesis, and it goes through a you know, whole litany of these different ways where you know, science and technology um, are creating all these dangers for the world, and what do we do about them? And it's the precautionary principle, whatever that means. But then, um, you know, he has a four-part program for achieving stabilization, and I will just read off the four things you need to do to make our world less vulnerable and achieve stabilization in this sort of, you know, we have this exponentiating technology where maybe it's not progressing that quickly, but still progressing quickly enough. There are a lot of uh, dangerous corner cases. 
You only need to do these four things to, uh, to stabilize the world. Number one, restrict technological development. Number two, ensure that there does not exist a large population of actors representing a wide and recognizably human distribution of motives. So uh, th that's a, that sounds like a somewhat incompatible with the DEI, at least in the, in the ideas form of diversity. Um, number three, establish ext extremely effective preventive policing. And number four, establish effective global governance, since you can't let, you know, even if there's like one little island somewhere where this is, doesn't apply, it's no good. And, uh, and so it is basic, and this is, you know, this is the zeitgeist on the other side. It is, uh, it is the precautionary principle. It is, you know, we're not gonna make it for another century on this planet, and therefore, you know, we need to have, you know, we need to embrace a one world totalitarian state right now. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so third and fourth counter arguments. The third, okay, just to repeat, the first argument, first counter argument is science is great. It's solving everything. Don't even pay attention to the humanities. Counter argument, no, it's not. Uh, third main counter argument, well, science is too dangerous. We have to slow it down. So it's, it's, it's good that it's not so great. We're slowing it down. We need to slow it down even more. And then the, uh, the counter counter argument, um, and this is, is where I would return to classical liberalism, is that uh, however dangerous, however dangerous science and technology are, uh, it, seems, it seems to me that totalitarianism is far more dangerous and, uh, and that, uh, and, uh, that uh, you know, uh, whatever the dangers are in the future, uh, we need to never underestimate the danger of, um, you know, one world totalitarian state. Once you get that, uh, hard, hard to see what it ends. Uh, you know, there's always, um, you know, I, 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 there's always sort of the, uh, um, the, the frame um, where, uh, um, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 3, the, the political slogan of the Antichrist is peace and safety. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, what I, what I want to suggest is that, and, it's, it's, and you get it when you have sort of a homogenized, one-world totalitarian state, and, uh, and what I want to suggest in closing is perhaps we would uh, uh, do well to be a little bit more scared of the Antichrist and a little bit less scared of Armageddon. Thank you very much. And I, I write your point that 4% growth is the key to solving all problems about once a week, so <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I don't think you, you hit quite hard enough. It almost sounds like you were... Um, uh, sympathetic with the uh, dual-use criticism of technology, um, but I think it's it, it's important to bash that if if you were bashing it super hard, and if you weren't bashing it, I get to disagree with you. Um, <clears throat> we could have abundant, essentially free energy right now if the anti-nuclear movement hadn't stopped it in the U.S. It wasn't about India, uh, Pakistan. The region, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, hasn't certified a single nuclear power plant since 1975 in the United States has nothing to do with that. We, we could have free to reactors now. The danger is much less than the danger of burning coal, even if you include the Three Mile Islands. It isn't, um, uh, it, it isn't because of uh, uh, dual use that every airplane down at the Palo Alto airport uses an engine designed in the 1950s. It's the FAA. Uh, the reason that, that roads, the high-speed train cost us $100 billion and therefore will never be built, that subways cost $4 billion a mile and never will be built, I, I think you, the, the, the thesis, of growth comes from technology, but the thesis that, it, that we are not growing because government regulation is in the way, I think, is one that we need to take more seriously. Well, I, and I, it's I, a leftist I, cause. Look, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I, I, I would disagree with the nuclear history where I, I think, you know, I think it was fear of nuclear war that was conflated with nuclear power plants and that turned people against them. So we could, and we could spend a long time going, going through that history. You know, I, 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 I agree with you on all the micro-regulatory stuff. There is, the regulations are stupid. I'd get rid of them. I, I'd, I'd, want to, I'd want to roll them back. Uh, and then at the same time, there is, this, you know, there is this cultural backdrop where, you know, there are some things that have gone wrong. We had, you know, thalidomide, you know, that, that was, you know, that empowered the FDA to, to become far more draconian. I think the FDA, should, you know, overreacted to the, the thalidomide disaster. But there's something in our society where, where um, some of these risks, you know, were able to be weaponized, 
in, um, in a very drastic way. And I, 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 I think this is, this is where the, the, the simple, naive libertarian arguments, they just never carry the day. Even though, yeah, if, if, if I could do it every, in every single instance, I'd push a button and deregulate. And, but uh, but it's, 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 it's not been working. You know? and, and the nuclear power thing is a striking one, where it's, it's obvious we should be doing this, and it is, it's been completely stuck for 45 years. It's not, it's not like it's a little bit outside the Overton window. It's way, way, way outside the Overton window. Hello. Um, so my name is Adithia. I'm an undergraduate student studying philosophy and political science here at Stanford, right for the review. Um, one of my, so my question is, uh, there's this quote I remember, uh, I think it's from Adorno, uh, Theodore Adorno, or maybe some like anti-colonial scholar commenting on him, uh, something like that. It goes, uh, the only way to gain progress is to stop talking about it. And uh, his argument, essentially, uh, if I recall correctly, is that the more we talk about progress, the more it gives leeway to sort of totalitarian, you know, colonialist structures, imperialist structures that allow you to oppress people who are behind, right? It's like the West is better or more farther in progress than the East or something like that. Um, if we sort of invert that argument, it seems like the language of progress in many ways motivates the DI officers to progress by you know, perhaps expanding access of education to minorities. We're learning new things about equity and fair freedom and equal, uh, all these values which we didn't have before, therefore we should impose them on the, you know, the, the sort of loser reactionaries who are convening at a conference, talk about academic freedom. So um, <laughs> basically my, my question is, why not adopt this sort of motto of we will continue to progress and pursue progress, but we frame it all in a language of return. Um, the same way sort of a lot of, I think, religious reactionaries, like myself and others on, on the Stanford, um, are, are trying, to, trying to do. Uh, so we still want progress, but uh, we, we, don't, we don't sound like we do. Um, I'm somewhat confused by exactly <coughs> what that means, but I, look, I, 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 I would agree with you that um, there's, there's something about progress that's been hijacked. We still have people who call themselves progressives. Um, it's, 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 it's much less clear how you quantify what they are uh, progressing on. Um, and then if we, if we frame it in terms of science, technology, per capita GDP, number of nuclear power plants, we try to quantify these things, um, it seems like we are, we're not actually that, uh, that progressive on, um, you know, on a lot of Dimensions, and I, th I think one way, and this is sort of just a narrow political framing, but one way to describe the decline away from progress, that you know, which I think still had this more general sense of not just a political word, but also a science word, and also a societal word in the 1930s, 1950s, 60s, um, to today, is that uh, is the way that we have uh, instead of using the word progress, we use the word change, and. The, uh, the Obama 2008 campaign, it, um, the initial slogan was hope and change, which was, um, and then they, they changed the slogan in the course of the campaign to um, um, the change we need, which if you think about it, is the exact opposite of the first one. The first one was as much change as possible. The second one was as little change as is absolutely necessary. Uh, and it was because the word change poll tested very badly because people sensed that when you talk about change, you're not talking about progress. You're, and in fact, most of the time, you, you talk about change when it's non-progressive change, i.e. it is regressive and it's change for the worse. Um, and so yeah, so I think it is, it is all a very paradox. I, I don't think we can, you know, I'm not, I don't think we can simply go back to the past. I don't think we can, um, we can, um, we should completely, uh, I think we should try to reclaim this question of progress. We should be asking, you know, how, where is the growth? How will the next generation do better than the current ones in any of a number of different dimensions of, of, of what counts as better? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think the, the fact that the left no longer believes in these things means there, there, there should be some opening to, 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 reclaim, to reclaim this ground. But, but simply going back to the past can't work because then we're just going to cycle and repeat. I mean, there has to have been something that didn't quite work with classical liberalism, even if it was a golden age of classical liberalism past, you know, we, we end up here today. This is always, you know, 
I don't know, this is too polemical, but you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, in the 80s when I was at Stanford, you saw these Marxist professors, and the sort of line was, you know, um, true Marxism has never been tried, they always said. And uh, I often wonder that if, if someone, someone calls themselves a liberal, a classical liberal today, you know, is it, are they like a Marxist professor from 1985 where, you know, true liberalism has never been tried? I think it's tried, it hasn't quite worked. We have to be a little bit critical of it to figure out where it went wrong and then, you know, how to progress into something that combines the best elements of classical liberalism with, uh, with something else for the future. Um, hi, uh, Hollis Robbins. I'm Dean of Humanities at University of Utah. And I certainly like the idea that uh, I can tell people to say, why humanities? Well, Peter Thiel says you should study humanities. I know that you didn't exactly say that. But, I, <laughs> but I'll use it for my own answer. It was a relative uh, argument. It was a relative argument. But, but I'm interested in, in listening to you, trying to figure out the admixture of optimism and pessimism. Because on the one hand, the past isn't enough, but we should study it. On the other hand, we, we, have, to be, we have to be looking toward the future, but can't be uh, too, too optimistic, and we have to be realistic. So I suppose I want to ask just a simple question, uh, especially in the midst of this, uh, of this uh, discussion that is, up to this point, been very pessimistic, is what does success look like? Well, I, I always... I always um dislike that question a lot. Um, you know, I, um, I, 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 I tend to think, um, I dislike psycho psychology. We don't, we have too, we've overdosed on psychology. It's, it's just, uh, we've overdosed on therapy, all this, all this nonsense. And uh, optimism and pessimism are just, you know, I think bad forms of psychotherapy. Um, they are, um, you know, the, they are in some sense, um, at the extreme limit case, they're the same thing. You know, extreme optimism, it's like, okay, you just need to sit back and watch the movie of the future unfold and eat some popcorn. You don't need to do anything. The singularity is near. It's that Ray Kurzweil type thing. That's extreme optimism. Extreme pessimism is, um, you know, die with dignity or not very much, but, you know, um, and, uh, and nothing you can do. And it's because extreme optimism and extreme pessimism, uh, you know, extreme optimism is, um, is denial. Extreme pessimism is acceptance, but they both they both sum up to sloth. It is, they're both forms of extreme laziness where you're not going to do anything. And so if, 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 you, had to, if you had to give you know, an accurate picture, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's true, but the healthy, the healthy one is so, we're somewhere in between. You know? it, we're, it, is not, it is not destined that this planet is going to self-destruct. It's not destined that it's going to become a totalitarian one world state. There is some path in between. It's, it's hard. We shouldn't accept totalitarianism or, or destruction. You have to fight. You have to work on it. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of where I always, uh, I always get back to some form of individual human agency, uh, you know, the indomitability of the human spirit. And uh, it, it, it can't be guaranteed. If you're, as soon as you make it too optimistic or too pessimistic, that is, uh, that's, uh, you're lost. So, uh, I'm Rick Schwader. I'm a cultural anthropologist and cultural psychologist at the University of Chicago. First of all, thank you for that utterly engaging and provocative talk. Um, everything is the state. Nothing is outside the state. Nothing is against the state. Something like that was Mussolini's definition originally of fascism. How far down the, that road do you think we have gone in this society? Um, oh, that's a da dangerous question. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it, I, I never know how to how to think about that. I, I think um, it's 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 way way further than I would like. Um, you know, on the other hand, we can have we can have conferences like this. We can we can talk about things. There are a lot of things you get in trouble for, but you can still talk about them in small groups anonymously. Uh, you know, there are parts of the internet that have been taken over by the state, but it, the internet still is in some ways more free than it was, you know, it was, it was, it was 20 years ago. Um, so I, I don't know. I, th I think it's, um, it's, it's uncomfortably, there's sort of uncomfortable elements that are, that are that way. Uh, there, there's an uncomfortable entanglement that the U.S. has with China where, you know, you know, we, we're rivals, but 
the danger is always, you know, you have to choose your enemies well because you will soon become just like them. And are we going to copy the kind of surveillance totalitarian AI that China has and impose that in the US? So there, there are sort of, I think there are, you know, in all sorts of ways where I think it's, uh, it's, it's been pushed too far, but, uh, but it's still, um, you know, I don't know, I, I'd still much rather live in the US than China. So all these, all these ways, we shouldn't be too extreme on it. Peter Blair uh, from Harvard and Hoover. Uh, Peter, when you opened the talk, you said that the antonym of diversity is the university. And one of the things that I've been thinking about during my time at Hoover is the ability of universities to cultivate human potential. Um, for the past 12 years, through the Teal Fellows Program, you've encouraged people to drop out of the university. What are some of the lessons that you've learned through the Teal Fellows Program about how to cultivate human potential, especially given that, in a sense, like the Teal Fellows Program is operating as kind of like the antonym to the university for the cultivation of human potential? Well, I, I'm, always, I'm always hesitant to do too much of a pitch for, for these, these various programs. It was, um, it, um, you know, in, in, in some sense it was a very narrow program. It was, you know, uh, 20, 20 students a year. We've done about 10 classes at this point, uh, a little bit over 200, um, 200 uh, people. Um, you know, it's been, you know, it's been very uneven. But uh, even the median, I think, has been, been quite successful. I think about a quarter, they can always go back to college. So it's not, it's, we never say it's drop out because the colleges always want to, um, they want to have high graduation rate. And so um, if, you, if you stop out, we always use the word stop out. If you stop out, you can always still come back 10 years later because you know, the universities are so corrupt. They're just, they're just trying to, you know, they're just trying to rig all their numbers. Um, and so, um, but, uh, but, but uh, um, and it, you know, there's, there's one sense in which, it was a very narrow program, you know, and you know what should be so shocking about it that you could have 20 people a year in the U.S. who could do better than going to a university or in the world. But, you know, it's mostly mostly a U.S. program, and um, and then um, but then it, you know it obviously triggered all these larger debates about you know our general society where you know there's um, there's sort of uh, too much of the tracks are just not going anywhere. And even though I can't accept that many people in our program, haven't figured out how to scale it, there is this very broad anxiety that, you know, the, the, col the colleges are not teleological. They're not leading to, to something, be something better. You know, it's, uh, it's I, you know, I think Stanford is a little bit healthier than most places because people figure out you're supposed to study computer science. It's a, it's a little bit narrow. But, uh, you know, I would say there only are, there only are, there only are two majors that, that translate into reasonably well-paying jobs outside the universities, computer science and petroleum engineering, um, and and there's and so there is there's some way that you know in, even on the elite university level there's, there's some way this whole elite formation thing has has badly broken down. It's not all the university's fault, but um, but I, I I wonder whether the sort of extreme egalitarianism of elite universities is a kind of defense mechanism to avoid dealing. With the ways in which they're betraying their students, and so um, if you tell your students check your privilege, um, you know you shouldn't expect to do more than the average person. Um, that's a way for the university to, you know, it, to absolve itself of the responsibility to um, to see to it that its students become, you know, the leading leading members of our society. So egalitarianism is sort of the excuse for um, a failed elitism. Thanks.